Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, I want to begin just by saying thank you to everyone who is here with us tonight. Uh, we're so excited about this book and it um, represents, it actually represents about 10 years worth of work, believe it or not. Uh, an enormous amount of work went into this and briefly, um, I wanted to do this book uh, with the help of Warren Perry, uh, who was a museum curator and historian with the Smithsonian who sadly passed away right before this uh, book came out. But what we wanted to do with this book was tell a much fuller story of Rocky Flats uh, and tell it from the perspective, not just from as full, in Full Body Burden, I told the story from people who lived near Rocky Flats, grew up near Rocky Flats, worked at the plant. Um, this book is a little bit different in it. it. It's a collection of essays by all different sorts of people, um, educators, historians, academics, scientists, um, an FBI agent, all, many, many different people who have been involved in the Rocky Flats story for a very long time and have a lot to say about the subject. And so that's what we wanted to do with this book, was bring all these different voices together and provide a greater historical and cultural context uh, of the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant, which is a very important story historically and in terms of the environment and public health, not just in Colorado, but nationally and indeed internationally. It's a very, very important story and a key part of the Cold War history uh, of the United States. So that's all I'm going to say about the book in general, uh, except to say that I'm very, very pleased that so many of the contributors can be with us here today. I will just say very briefly about my own essay that I wrote uh, for uh, Doom With A View. What I wanted to do was look at um, some of the whistleblowers and people who had been key in terms of helping to uncover the truth of what really happened at Rocky Flats. So I talk about some of the whistleblowers who um, worked at the plant, uh, some of the people who worked in the community, and uh, why their stories are so important to acknowledge and to remember. So the first person I want to introduce is Dr. Mark Johnson. Dr. Mark Johnson has been the executive director of Jefferson County Public Health since April 1990. He graduated from medical school at Loma Linda University and received his medical specialty training and master of public health degree from Johns Hopkins University. He is board certified in preventive medicine and public health and is a past president of the American College of Preventive Medicine. So Dr. Mark Johnson. Thank you, Kristen. My essay is essentially a history of my journey from being a pro-nuclear youth growing up in Western Colorado, proud of our contribution to producing the atomic bomb and the work that we were doing on the Western Slope uh, to help fight the Cold War, into being a confused, conflicted, and concerned public health official in Jefferson County as I watched what was going on, particularly around the cleanup of Rocky Flats. I began my, my job there just after the FBI and EPA raid and was uh, involved in a number of the things that were going on as they began to decide how to clean up, what to clean up, and what was going to be done with Rocky Flats after the cleanup. The more I worked with individuals from the federal government and the contractors who were out there, the more concerned I became and finally became, I guess, what you might call a, a anti-nuclear activist concerned about the, particularly about the long-term effects of the nuclear and other uh, hazardous waste that has been left on the Rocky Flats campus. Essentially, because of my work there and following on uh, Carl Johnson's work, I uh, have titled my essay, Enemies of the People, because many of those who, who are working around that area do see public health and public health officials as enemies of the people because of our concerns about what's going on at Rocky Flats. Thank you, Kristen. 
I would next like to introduce John Lipsky, uh, MAS and retired FBI. John Lipsky was a lead FBI criminal investigator of federal environmental crimes at the Rocky Flats Nuclear Weapons Plant in Golden, Colorado from 1987 to 1992. He was also a Las Vegas, Nevada Metropolitan Police Officer. John contributed to the Ambush Grand Jury nonfiction and nonprofit book to enlighten the public concerning US government misdeeds and about the fact that Rocky Flats will never be safe. He testified as a subject matter expert witness for plaintiffs in the Cook v. Rockwell federal lawsuit. John Lipsky. My name is John Lipsky and I'm retired FBI and I represent the nonprofit Echo Ed. And my essay is Criminal Fallout at Rocky Flats within Kristen Iverson's anthology that I hope hopefully you will all read. And um, just thinking through it really quickly, I first learned about Rocky Flats in 1984 when my wife read about the place in the paper when we were doing our house hunting in Denver. And we decided that we were not going to live near there. And uh, by 1987, I was involved in the Rocky Flats investigation. And it um, is pretty much the, uh, the centerpiece for the, uh, the essay that I wrote. And I, I would just like to point out with the politics the way it is today, um, Bill Barr was our attorney general in 1992. And uh, his twisted policies has made it so that the cleanup at Rocky Flats will never be safe. And I can't emphasize that enough, that the government was not looking out for us, so there was a big cover up. And I know that the refuge is open right now, but um, there's still millennia left for Rocky Flats to, to glow in the dark. And you won't see it, you won't taste it, you won't smell it. But uh, there's still plutonium out there. And with a latency period of 20 years, you won't notice the maladies that you might get from there. So it's not instant service, but it can be very deadly. And thank you to all for being a part of this tonight. Thank you. OK, I would next like to uh, introduce Kathleen Sullivan. Uh, Kathleen Sullivan, uh, PhD, has been engaged in the nuclear issue for more than 30 years. Director of, a, director of Hibakush Stories, an arts-based initiative that has brought atomic bomb survivors to some 45,000 students, she produces nuclear-themed nuclear films, including two documentaries entitled The Last Atomic Bomb, and The Ultimate Wish Ending the Nuclear Age, and projects that focus on art for disarmament, utilizing the visual arts, music, and dance, uh, entitled The Nuclear Age in Six Movements, The Hiroshima Panels Project, and If You Love This Planet. Kathleen is a Nagasaki Peace Correspondent and Hiroshima Peace Ambassador. Kathleen. Hi, Welcome. thank you. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you so much. I just want to say I always love when we are doing our nuclear talks and there's a slight technical glitch because, you know, we need to be reminded that human beings and the computers that we have made are the only things that are hemming to the ground in international continental ballistic missiles at the moment, you know, like... It's crazy, um, and it has continued to extend this uh, radioactive violence along the front range. I, I have so much gratitude for the people who have authored the articles in this book, for Kristen, um, for Leroy and Judith, who I first started working, Leroy Moore and Judith Mulling, who I first started working on Rocky Flats issues back in 19. 89 after my great aunt Ann Swift drove me out to Rocky Flats in 1985 as an undergraduate um, at the University of Colorado in Boulder. I love Boulder. I love so many people who are involved in this project. I wrote about nuclear guardianship, um, which is how we must actively care for the radioactive materials that we are bequeathing to future generations. As John just 
uh, said, you know, millennia upon millennia, we will be seeing, not, not seeing, not tasting, not smelling, but being affected by the plutonium and other radioactive materials that are littered out there in a very beautiful part of the world. You know, I think about um, Candelis right now. It's the absolute opposite of nuclear guardianship where we are told to bring our families to this beautiful place to raise them in a healthy environment when it's on the buffer zone of Rocky Flats. Um, I'm especially grateful also to Jeff Geip, who at this point, his artwork, uh, The Cold War Horse, is really the only marker uh, that we have out on the site that speaks to what happened there, that speaks to our responsibility um, for future generations. And, um, you know, in writing about guardianship, there's so much that we need to guard, not only the physical material, but also the culture of care. And I'd like to um, say in closing that um, I've been involved with the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And we are very close to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons being entered into force. We need five more ratifications and then it will be illegal under international law, nuclear weapons, possession, use, threat of use, et cetera. And in the treaty, there are positive obligations which include environmental remediation. So when the treaty enters into force, one of the uh, projects that I have in mind is to write about nuclear guardianship vis-a-vis -vis Rocky Flats um, and the environmental remediation that we can be doing there to uh, protect future generations. Um, it's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be with you all. Thank you so much. I would next like to introduce Heidi Maybaum. Uh, Heidi Maybaum, PhD, is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Cincinnati. She holds a PhD from University College London and has held fellowships at Cambridge University and Princeton University. Her work concerns emotion, empathy, psychopathology, responsibility, and interpersonal understanding. Her books include Empathy and Morality from Oxford University Press, The Rutledge Handbook of Philosophy of Empathy, and Empathy also from Richard Rutledge, which is forthcoming. She is currently, she's currently writing a book about perspective taking. And Heidi's essay is very interesting in that she talks about the broader issue of democracy. And I just want to emphasize that um, some of us are focused in on, on um, very closely on issues that are quite regional and local to what's happened in Rocky Flats, but it's really important that we step back and take a broader perspective and a more historical and cultural perspective. Um, so Heidi's uh, work falls into this category. Heidi Maybaum. Yes, yeah, so um, oh. What I did in my essays in general to sort of respond to what you might imagine the US government would say, right? Deception was in the national interest when it came to Rocky Flats, right? We're engaged in this massive Cold War. The Soviet Union has nuclear weapons and it would be naive to suppose that unless we produce a bunch of nuclear weapons that we're not gonna get invaded, right? So deception, ultimately speaking, was in the national uh, interest. And there you're making an appeal to um, this notion of security that when you read the Declaration of Depend Independence, right, security is one of the big things that a government will ensure for its citizens. The problem with security, of course, is that it often conflicts or, cl or clashes with liberty, which is also one of the big tenets of the Declaration of Independence. Um, the problem, of course, is that once the government deceives its people as to certain fundamental facts, it endangers or makes impossible the citizens' uh, free choice of where to live, what occupation to engage in, and so on. So the question I'm asking, was the deception um, that surrounded Rocky Flats justified on the grounds of national security, taking into consideration the loss of liberty that was involved? And my answer is no. Um, I uh, point out um, that the USSR already knew the location of Rocky Flats, or at least, you know, maybe at the very beginning 
of uh, the establishment of Rocky Flats, there might have been some doubt of, 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 it of its location, but later on it was quite clear that the USSR knew where Rocky Flats was. So the idea that we're deceiving people so they won't know, so the information won't get out, was not an issue any longer. Uh, moreover, the main target during the Cold War was not actually the sites of weapon production, but major cities. And so that's another reason that it wasn't just justified. Um, a third reason um, that I'm pointing out is, of course, the fact that a large number of people uh, in America are very patriotic and are willing to sacrifice their lives for uh, the nation. And so they would very well, uh, most likely, be willing to work and put their lives at risk in this kind of activity, right? If you look back at the previous World War, World War I and II, weapons production has always historically been extremely dangerous for the people living around the plants, plants but also people working in the plants, and people were willing to work nonetheless. Um, and fourthly, typically, if you give a good, en good enough salaries and good enough benefits, a lot of people will work under very dangerous circumstances, right? I mean, you can, for instance, just think of the coal industry that's still limping along in the US, which is extremely damaging to the workers. And um, there, there is no problem getting workers there because of the good salaries um, and the benefits. So I go through all of these reasons that the government might have had for deceiving its population, and show that they don't actually hold. And then I raise a little suspicion that the suspicion actually is it's going to be a lot cheaper if you simply deny that this is going on because the health costs involved for the people who get sick from working at the plant or in the or living in the surrounding areas are enormous. Um, at the end of the day, if we're going to live in a nation where we take security seriously, we all have to, of course, contribute to paying the price that's involved. And what is particularly unjust in the case of Rocky Flats is that the responsibility falls just disproportionately in people who happen to live in one particular place. So the conclusion of my essay is that the, the tension between liberty and security um, does not justify the deception that was perpetrated by the US government surrounding Rocky Flats. Thank you. I would next uh, like to introduce Randy Stafford. Uh, Randy Stafford uh, is a senior manager at Oracle with a 32 year career in software architecture. He holds a bachelor of science degree in applied mathematics with graduate coursework in computer science from Colorado State University. Mr. Stafford has contributed to four books on software architecture and speaks frequently at software conferences. His mother grew up in Arvada and her siblings worked at Rocky Flats. Mr. Stafford served on the Jefferson Parkway Advisory Committee. And I might add that he has been um, deeply involved for years in Rocky Flats issues and in uh, examining uh, and summarizing all of the many studies about Rocky Flats that have done over the, been done over the years. Randy Stafford. Thank you, Kristen, and, and thank you, everyone who's attending. My name is Randy Stafford, and my chapter in Doom with a View surveys all known studies of off-site contamination um, and all known studies of health in the population around the site. The existence of plutonium contamination in the soil downwind of the former industrial area is undisputed across 50 years of studies, um, some 12 to 15 studies, and including uh, verification last summer, um, the, hot, the most radioactive particle yet found um, just a, a few hundred feet west of Indiana Street near the old Eastgate Road. Um, and epidemiological studies by uh, public health scientists and statisticians demonstrate increased cancer in its incidence in the downwind population. And anecdotal evidence in new neighborhoods near the plant shows an obvious trend of unexpected cancer incidents, including extremely rare cancers and cancers in young people. And yet uh, governments at all levels continue to facilitate development in the area and disturbance of contaminated soil threatening resuspension of respirable carcinogenic plutonium dioxide particles. 
So my chapter evaluates government's fulfillment of its assumed moral obligation to protect public health from Rocky Flats contamination. Um, as Kristen mentioned, I applied for and was selected to the Jefferson Parkway Advisory Committee, which was a citizens committee established by the Jefferson Parkway Public Highway Authority in 2017. If you're not familiar with the Jefferson Parkway, it's a proposed four lane toll road right up the east side of um, the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge in, in plutonium contaminated soil. So obviously the construction activity will disturb that soil. Um, my goal in applying to be on the advisory committee was to have an opportunity to formally advise the authorities board of directors of the public health risk of building the Jefferson Parkway through the Indiana Street Corridor. And that goal was accomplished. I, I had that opportunity. My hope is that everyone in attendance here tonight will become concerned about the public health risk and policy issues that still surround Rocky Flats site and engage with government at all levels to um, basically stop the madness of, of development in that area. So for a thorough elaboration on all those themes, uh, please read my chapter in Doom with the View and thank you. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Heidi Hutner. Heidi Hutner uh, holds a PhD and she is Director of Sustainability Studies and an Associate Professor at Stony Brook University in New York. Heidi writes about the environment for magazines, books, and academic journals. She is the author of Colonial Women from Oxford University Press, and she is currently working on two books, Earth Room, Notes from a Professor and Mother, and Nowhere, an Atomic Memoir. She holds a PhD from the University of Washington. Heidi Hutner. Thanks so much, um, Kristen, for inviting me and to be part of this project. I'm honored. And um, thank you to everyone else on this panel. Your work is very inspiring to me. Many of you I've met in person and interviewed, and I'm just grateful to be part of this. Um, and I'm most thankful to the women who live near Rocky Flats and who gave me a lot of their time and shared personal stories with me. My chapter, um, the, A Grieving Landscape, uh, Wombs and Homes Cannot Protect, looks at the relationship of families and the domestic sphere to Rocky Flats and to nuclear disaster sites in general. That is sort of the scope of my work. Actually, the book I'm working on is the titles have changed, but I'm not going to go there right now. If you go to my website, you can look at the titles of my work. But um, the scope of my work really examines uh, the relationship of women to nuclear history and present and gender issues. So it turns out that women and girls are most impacted by exposure to radiation. Women are very often and in largest numbers, the most active in anti-nuclear work. Um, Kathleen was discussing this, the treaty when you, I was lucky enough to be in the room at the UN um, and interview a lot of people there. When you looked around that room, it was predominantly women. So it's an interesting thing when a student asked me today, why, why is it that women take the lead on anti-nuclear actions? I didn't have a good answer. And that doesn't mean men are not involved. But uh, there are really key issues involved with that. And there's also the, the question of the silencing of women. So we often don't hear women's voices in nuclear policy. They don't get to make nuclear make decisions in policy and government positions. They're not usually part of the design of um, the, the whole kind of nuclear system. So it's a so I kind of ask those questions. Why are women's voices silenced? And I actually go and interview many, many of the women who live locally and I tell their stories and we hear from them and I give voice to the silenced. Um, I'm also working on a documentary which does the same kind of project at um, the Three Mile Island site where there was a nuclear meltdown, America's worst um, nuclear com commercial nuclear reactor meltdown. And I'm really interested in this question of you know, the silencing of women's voices and also the silencing of indigenous voices around um, nuclear history and nuclear disasters and exposures. So thank you, Kristen. I'm keeping it short and honored to be on this panel and honored to be part of your, your book project. Stephanie uh, Maley, PhD, is an environmental sociologist specializing in natural resource sociology, governance, and rural development with a focus on the community impacts of resource extraction and energy production. Her main interests include environmental justice, environmental health, 
social mobilization and the socio-environmental effects of market-based economies. Stephanie serves as an associate professor in the Department of Sociology at Colorado State University, and she's an adjunct associate professor with the Colorado School of Public Health. She completed a Mellon Foundation postdoctoral fellowship at Brown University after earning her PhD in sociology from Utah State University. Stephanie, thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you for having me and thank you, um, like Heidi said to all the panelists, I'm so thrilled just to be part of this amazing book. So thank you, Kristen, for convening all of us. It is so fun to, to kind of see everyone in one spot during these book launches too and book events. Um, so just a little bit on my chapter that I, I have to say I co-authored with Becky Alexis Martin, who's a, um, she's an amazing PhD in geography and Carol Jensen, who is um, or was, she retired recently, she was with the um, nursing program at Metro State in Denver. So I had some very wonderful co-authors who helped with my chapter as well. Um, but what we look at in the chapter is um, examining part and talking about part of our exploratory community-based health study. And this really started because community members who had either been diagnosed with rare cancers or who had family members who were or who had lived in the area and had developed rare diseases or ailments um, contacted us and, and or me and, and several other folks who worked on this chapter with me and they were really concerned that they were seeing these impacts and when they would reach out to the health department for example or when they would reach out to state agencies to try to have a community-based health study done they they were not um, really taken seriously, right? People would say there's no evidence of links between environmental contamination from the Rocky Flat site and these health problems. And so we really launched this exploratory study because community members asked us to do this. And unfortunately, we haven't had enough funding to do the scale of a study that I would love to do and that they would like to see done. But what we've been able to do is collect oral histories of people experiencing these diseases and illnesses either themselves or in their families um, and we're really trying to mirror and complement the Maria Rogers oral history project whose archives are at uh, University of Colorado Boulder so that we're accumulating this um, kind of trove of information about what people have experienced that that oral history project focused more on workers and on people who were initial activists. It's amazing if you have a chance to check it out, but um, we're trying to expand that to include community members and people experiencing health issues now. So in the chapter, we really focus on that. We look at um, the story of those individuals and contested illnesses, which are illnesses that people experience and connect to environmental contamination in this case, but which aren't legitimated by the medical profession, by state health agencies and things like that. And we focus on it and look at it from issues of environmental justice and procedural equity. And the chapter is full of stories told by people who were trusting enough to disclose really personal and often heart-wrenching information to us about these health experiences that they've had. Um, so I, I will stop there to give everyone a chance to talk, but we are very grateful that people were willing to share their stories with us and continue to share their stories because like I said, often these are very personal experiences and people have been um, shut down so often when they've shared them before. So we get into that a lot more in the chapter and um, I invite you to read that along with the other amazing chapters that are included in the, in the book. So thank you all. Mm -hmm. 